Uh, and it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Yustvan Rosum, a good friend of the program uh, and one of the current instructors in the condensed program that is nearing its last week. Uh, Yus graduated from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in The Hague, uh, where he studied with Herit Nordzai. Uh, he worked uh, at Monotype and Meta Design uh, before starting his own independent type design practice, uh, where he f uh, focuses on typeface design as well as software design uh, for typography and type design. Uh, along with Eric Van Blockland, he uh, runs a project, collaborative project Letterer, uh, which created a lot of really interesting typefaces, including Beowulf, which is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, it's in the permanent collection of MoMA. Um, they also did the typeface for uh, the Twin Cities, the, for the design festival in Twin Cities, another one of my favorite projects. Lots of lots of amazing, uh, interesting typefaces that have pushed the boundaries of what you can do with typeface design, especially in terms of programming. Uh, he also co-wrote uh, Robofog uh, with Peter von Blockland uh, in the mid-90s, which is a precursor to Robofont, which is now becoming one of the main industry tools for typeface design, one of the most influential tools now, uh, that takes advantage of the Python printing, uh, Python program language that uh, expands the capabilities of that. He also wrote the original version of Drawbot, um, which I'm sure we'll see uh, quite a bit of today. Um, and he teaches along with uh, his teaching here at Taipei Cooper. He teaches in uh, both programs at the uh, Royal Academy of Fine Arts in The Hague, the KABK program, the undergrad level, as well as the master's program, the Type Media program. So please welcome Yusman Awesome. Thank you, Sasha. That's, um it's a sizable crowd. Thank you for all uh, for coming for coming here. I'm a little nervous, but I will get into it, I suppose. Um, so th uh, thanks to the Type of Cooper program for and Cooper Union and the Balance Center for inviting me over. It's been it's a great honor. I've seen many lectures in this series, and I've only been disappointed once. So it's a really good series. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, this is how you spell my name. I'm from Harlem. I'm almost 51 years old. I'm a programmer. I'm a designer, type designer. Uh, Sasha also already uh, uh, summarized it uh, better than that. Um, today, is gonna we're going to talk a lot about uh, programming. And one of the reasons that I uh, got into that was this little device, which looks huge on the screen, but it was literally about this size, and you would hook it up to your television. Uh, my dad got that when I was 15, and all you could do with it was to program it. It didn't have a hard drive or whatever. You could save your programs if you were lucky on a cassette tape. It was nice and primitive, but to do something with it, you had to program. So I had to learn programming. Well, a little bit later, I studied, started studying graphic design in The Hague, uh, type design with Gerrit Noordzij, graphic design with many other people. This is actually an um, a example sheet that I made for my own students a few years ago, but it kind of shows, um, well, one of the approaches to, to lettering and writing um, and letters in general uh, in The Hague. So I teach both at the gra graphic design department as well as our type, mas type media master program for type design. Um, what else? Uh, Gerrit Noordzij has been visualized uh, uh, in a robot animation. He has been very influential um, initially in The Hague, but later uh, uh, throughout the world in his thinking about type, about inventing terminology to talk about type, to describe the relationship between writing and type design. Um, anyway, he's been providing us with, um, well, with terminologies and ways of thinking that are really have been very useful and are still being used um, not only at KBK in The Hague but all over the place. I mean, we still also apply some of that here at uh, the Type of Cooper Condensed program with my colleague Hannes, Hannes van Mira, who um, also studied at KBK. Anyway, a little bit of background. Um, after studying, I, for quite a while, I worked intensely together with Eric van Blockland and our little typeface called Beowulf that Sasha already mentioned. Um, brought us a little bit of uh, recognition early on, and that was because it was programmed. Um, we started with a type design that Eric drew uh, uh, as part of his, his studies, 
um, we converted it to a straight lines only, like a straight line segmented version, and then wrote PostScript code that would move every point around. Uh, so every time you would print it, uh, it would be slightly different. And I'm saying print it because this, uh, this stuff only happened on the printer. This is... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, around 89, there was no, uh, um, the, the type you saw on screen was mostly based on bitmaps. The outline uh, fonts did not render, uh, did not really exist on the screen. So you had an outline font, but that was downloaded to the printer, which contained a PostScript interpreter. And PostScript is actually a language, a programming language. It was designed to um, describe pages. It's a so-called page description language, but it's actually a, a, a full programming language. And we learned uh, a bit of how to, how to work with that, and out came uh, Beowulf. And one of the unintended side effects, which is simulated here, is that if you make something for print with color separations, that each color plate will come out different. So this, is, uh, this was kind of uh, an unforeseen side effect that we embraced. Um, Here's a little animation. Uh, we were really happy that a few years ago, I forgot when exactly, it was uh, acquired as part of the, the permanent collection of the MoMA here in New York. I mean, I don't think it means it's permanently on display, but they have it somehow. And there was, so we can say that they have it and that's good for us, I suppose. So, and this little animation was made uh, for, for that occasion. Um, So it gives a new meaning to the word movable type, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, so uh, early 90s, um, I made a sensor serif typeface and treated it in a similar way uh, with a hard, uh, on the top you see uh, uh, hard uh, edges and at the bottom you see softer edges. We use a slightly different algorithm for that. Um, Here's some text samples, but actually it's to introduce this quote from, by Eric Gill, letters are things, not pictures of things, which actually led us to the um, observation that letters are programs, not the results of programs. So, and actually, uh, as far as I understand, look like how uh, type is protected under American copyright law that mostly uh, works because fonts are software. So the fact that this is actually true gives typefaces some protection. If it's just a shape, uh, especially the American copyright law, but it's definitely not unique in the world, uh, gives very little protection uh, as far as, we but I'm not a lawyer, I don't know much about that. I just, okay, a bit about programming. So I already mentioned basic, the language that, uh, there are many kinds of basics, uh, the, um, but I used the one on that little computer I showed earlier. I learned Pascal, I learned PostScript, I learned C uh, as the years went on. And uh, at some point I had to progress in the mid nineties, like where to go next, because these things are, you know, not really pleasant to work with. These are difficult languages. C++ is, like, C is already difficult. C++ offers some nice things, but it's really hard to learn. Then there's a language called Smalltalk, which is also, just like C++, object-oriented. And my colleague and friend, Peter from Blockland, tried to show it to me. He did lots of work with that. It's pretty cool, but I found it, I, I couldn't get into it. He tried his best, but I, I somehow couldn't learn it. Um, easily enough. Maybe I didn't want to or I was stubborn, I don't know. It was just difficult. At some point, mid-90s, Python came along and I liked that a lot better. And that's not quite coincidental because look at the last name of its inventor. Um, this is my older brother, older and wiser brother as uh, we usually say. How Eric from Blockman talks about his older brother. We, that's funny, I mean Eric and I are roughly the same age and our older brothers are also roughly the same age. Anyway, parallelisms right there. Um, Python, a little bit about the language for, uh, um, it's, 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 the language is open source, it's platform neutral, it runs on all kinds, it runs on tiny little computers, embedded systems, uh, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever, Android, uh, um, pretty much everywhere. So, I don't know, we, we fell in love with Python because it's, it's really nice to work with, I mean, especially if you already have some sort of uh, programming background, it was, um, um, kind of a relief to work with that. Uh, some highlights of, 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 of more high profile users of Python. Google's a big Python user. Uh, the original YouTube was entirely written in Python. Dropbox is using a lot of Python. Uh, my brother is actually working at Dropbox at the moment. 
Uh, in the past, he has worked for Google for a while. So um, anyway, for scripting, um, it's a scripting language that lends itself to embedding into other uh, applications. In the type world, we have Robofont, we have Glyphs, we have FontLab. All of those have Python embedded available as a scripting language in different ways and different, but uh, Python is just in the type world all over the place. Uh, um, uh, the entire type production workflow at Adobe is based on Python. Uh, well, not entirely, but they, they use it a lot. I think they couldn't do without it anymore. Anyway, so here's uh, some projects that are built with Python that I was involved with. So, uh, so Sasha already mentioned Robofog, which was this mutant version of Photographer in the 90s where we added Python as a language, as a glue language, so we could automate it. The idea actually behind that was that the type design community is relatively small. and um, um, yet, all those type designers are very stubborn people and have very distinct opinions and uh, pro profound opinions about how their tools should work. So for even for one manufacturer to make a tool that would work for everyone, it's just not going to happen because the opinions are all over the map. So um, also, the, it's, as I said, it's a s relatively small community, so the market is relatively small. So a company like Adobe making Illustrator for millions of graphic designers for them, it's not interesting to develop a, a, a type design tool for maybe hundreds or thousands of people worldwide. I mean, compared to the number of Illustrator and Photoshop users, it's absolutely nothing. So for those kind of companies, it's just not interesting. So we, through contacts, of, uh, uh, Peter from Blockland, Font Bureau, David Burlow, the makers of uh, Photographer, we were allowed to use uh, the source code of an, an obsolete version of Photographer at the time, Photographer 3.5 something and we attached Python to it and used Python to uh, automate things, but also to be able that the user could extend it. So pretty much to allow type designers to build their own tools. If you're not happy, well, make your own tool. And this kind of platform allowed that. So that was kind of a precursor later when FontLab came, uh, became more popular. Uh, it also chose Python for the exact same reason. Um, Glyphs embeds Python, uh, Robofont was mostly written in Python, so it's, um, it's there. But we're not going to talk a lot about font technology today. Um, Drawbot, however, is um, a little tool that is also based on Python. Uh, let's see if this is... Okay, I have these little bumper animations of a letter Z. Um, we're switching to Drawbot now. So this was... Um, around in the early 2000s, uh, around 2003, we realized that our students at Type Media, that we should teach them a bit of Python too, because the language had become so important for the workflow in, in type design uh, that we thought, hmm, uh, how can we uh, make this a little bit more fun to learn? Because it's still not, uh, Python is a nice language, but if you've never programmed before, it's still hard. So, how to make it a little easier? Well, there was design by numbers from John Maeda as an example, this educational tool. It was a tiny thing. You could write tiny uh, programs, bits of uh, instructions that would draw something in a tiny square. Two students of him, him uh, Casey Reyes and Ben Fry, went on to create processing, and you've all heard of that. Uh, so, that's, that's, uh, that has become this huge thing in the world of creative coding. Uh, processing is based on Java. So, but I was looking at that and thinking like, hmm, that's, that's really nice. You, have, you can have a bit of code, you write some instructions, and you pretty much immediately get some visual results. Because programming can be very abstract. Like, basically, you can, on your Mac, you can fire up Terminal. Python is already on your computer. It's, it ships with Mac OS. You can type Python, and you get this in command line uh, interactive uh, interpreter where you could type commands. But it's a very text-based thing. And for graphic designers, type designers, more visually oriented, this kind of visual thing um, we thought would be better. So um, out came Drawbot um, around 2003. Uh, it's a Python environment. It's a friendly visual output, uh, good for visually oriented people. That uh, kind of nicely summarizes what I just said. Nice slide. All right. Um, I will now go through some early uh, things that, that uh, some of our students around that time, I forgot the exact year, but this, this might have been around 10 years ago. Some names uh, will sound familiar. So they were doing little exercises to create patterns, to use random numbers, to, um, well, create some actual patterns, uh, play a little bit with uh, perspective, um, um, repetitions, rotations, play with colors, um, maybe also make some drawings. 
um, whatever it is, yeah, the, uh, psychedelic things are always, uh, has always been nice things. Uh, a bit later on, we started to focus a little bit more on type, and um, around the time when Frederick Berlan was studying that, uh, well, he took this uh, beyond everything else. Uh, Frederick Berlan was an exceptional student in our Type Media Master Program. Um, who picked up uh, programming at uh, a speed that have, has pretty much not been surpassed since as, in terms of student learning. And he created this whole system, a uh, parametric, uh, a bit like Metafont. If that, uh, if, if that doesn't mean anything to you, look it up. It's, it's been a revolutionary, well, a very influential way of uh, programmatically defining, defining type from the early 80s, I think, uh, uh, by Donald Knut, who I think last year, September, did a talk about that it in uh, San Francisco as part of the Cooper West program, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, so uh, yeah, th th he built this whole user interface to uh, his machine called Caligulator, and it was kind of a calligraphy emulation system where all kinds of numbers can be set and out comes an alphabet, more or less. So this was a really advanced kind of um, uh, exceptional project within type media even. Um, but also more normal things happened like uh, uh, like to program, program uh, things that do something. Well, you can kind of see the logic in this, uh, but for instance, an, a variation would have been uh, this. So kind of the same logic and you replace the, the logic of one little item with something else and well, the rest just stands. So these are typically the kind of things that uh, programming lends itself for very well. Now, we have to move on because programming was, uh, uh, Drawbot was getting old and getting limited. And actually, um, in 2013, Frederick Berlan, I mentioned his name already, um, pretty much rewrote Drawbot from scratch, like at least for 99% uh, or something. By the way, just in case you don't know, he's also the author of uh, 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 Robofont. So he's a really accomplished um, programmer. Um, so the old drawbot was really primitive, and he added all kinds of things that made it much nicer to work with. Uh, there was a better preview, more interactivity, um, uh, multi-page output, and suddenly animation and GIF output. Well, hmm. now this opens some possibilities. Well, here uh, um, a short slide about what drawbot is not. It is not uh, HTML5 and Canvas, it's not processing, it's not super interactive, it's not very efficient, it's not running on Windows, it's also not Notebooks. That's kind of a similar application that actually has a similar source. It was originally a fork from the original Drawbot. Anyway, but what is it? It is vector-based and you can make uh, high quality PDF output with it and it has very good text support. Like if you wanna mess with open type features, turn them on or off, uh, you can make some decent typography with it programmatically. So you can kind of reprogram your InDesign. It's kind of what, what, what Peter von Blockland has been doing with his PageBot project that's running on top of Drawbot, that's providing this whole intelligent layer of uh, layout, and uh, my head explodes when he tries to explain it, but it's, very, it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic project. Um, so let's continue some more recent years of uh, Type Media students working with Drawbot. Uh, Bachmann was playing, trying to make rougher edges based on an existing outline. Christian, are you here tonight? Christian Vargas um, uh, studied at Type at Cooper Condensed a couple of years ago, then went to The Hague, and I, he was again my student in The Hague. Um, and now, since a couple of months, he's back in New York. So, uh, I don't know. So, this, this is uh, actually, I should apologize to him because this is not his final thing. This was something in between. He was still working on it. Um, but still, he worked with colors and it, it could move in the end also. Um, people did very different things. Like, this guy tried to, um, on a simple way, uh, emulate some calligraphy. Um, the same, pretty much the same algorithm with slightly different settings. What I always encourage my students to do is that like, don't limit the numbers that you're working with. Don't try to like, hey, this will be the, the, the reasonable range of the settings that I will use, but maybe some settings will appear. I mean, he didn't foresee this, but if we just take your value and uh, take a number, so this is all controlled by numbers, but usually, yeah, you have a range of numbers which is valid for what you want to do. But if you go beyond that, maybe you get these happy little accidents, as I like to call them. In that sense, Bob Ross has been very influential in our way of teaching here. Um, so, yeah, all kinds of different things. Uh, uh, Marco tried all more kind of decorative uh, uh, filter -y kind, uh, kind of effects on that. Um, Philip tried uh, something with serif variations. 
Um, this was um, Tetsuo Suzuki uh, made this wonderful puzzle-like thing. Um, so they're, they're relatively, well, they, they can make their exercises as complicated as they want. Um, some keep it relatively easy. You know, it, it, it can be a very hard subject and not everyone learns it at an equal pace. So, and that is fine. Um, it's just, yeah, people's brains are wired, wired differently and, uh, um, well, it's, but it's, it's, I think, for everyone a very useful exercise. Um, even if they don't become programmers later, they at least know a little bit about the kind of thinking that goes behind, uh, goes into it. Because, you know, with programming, you have to be fairly precise. You have to kind of tell precisely what you want to do. There's this video on YouTube of a, a, a father asking his kids, can you write down for me how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich? And then they, the small kids, both of them write down a recipe and he starts to literally follow those instructions. It's very funny. And that's, that's kind of a nice analogy for how, what's, what's, what is difficult about programming. Because, you know, the computer will just do exactly what you tell it. And that is not necessarily what you mean to tell it. But that's the process of learning. Um, anyway, more students' experiments. Um, and this is a, a little thing from me from around the same time. This is the ultimate slap serif H. Um, <laughs> there's an endless amount of slap serifs on it. It's like, it's like the, the a typographic yo dog uh, joke, like let's put some serifs on your serif so you can serif all your serif or something, I don't know. Um, anyway, by, by changing some numbers, you can make it go drunk. So this is an example of a recursive algorithm. We come back to that later of what that means or what you can, how you can use that. And so here from last year, some more student projects from last year, um, people now suddenly getting into the whole animation, animation aspect of Drawbot and using that on some, uh, either their own typeface or making something uh, specifically for it or just drawing one letter that is doing dubious things. Um, this is a really nice uh, reinterpretation of Calypso by Mark Ruo. I'm really, uh, really happy how this turned out. It was uh, pretty complicated setting up all the mask stuff, but he did it. And I don't remember if he did the full alphabet, but it definitely, I mean, it was already quite a bit of work to get this, this word running. So you should check him out. Um, here, um, uh, the co Western cowboy wood type-ish kind of things, but then parameterized, like with different settings, uh, different outcomes. It's a relatively simple setup, but it can be effective. Um, this was a project that I was very happy with. This guy um, thought a bit further beyond the normal, normal interpolation thing. Like, what can we interpolate the right-hand side of a letter with the left-hand side of the next letter? And uh, he, he did it. So, uh, um, finally, this is, uh, was our star student last year um, who built a whole, well, an interesting set of things. He drew a bunch of letters. Uh, and apply it at, at some smart algorithms going on. Um, uh, funnily, I only found out later uh, that he, before he came to The Hague to study at Type Media, he studied, ac uh, he studied in Utrecht, where for a while he was taught by Hansje van Halem, a famous uh, Dutch graphic designer who I will mention later on for another thing. And it's somehow, um, after that, I kind of realized, yeah, he might have been influenced a little bit, but it's like what you can do with letters here and there. Although I still think this is a fairly original kind of project. All right, uh, next subject. So, at some point, uh, you know, I was getting affected by this drawbot stuff myself all over again uh, by Frederick's new version and the capabilities that it offered. And I started to make some little animations. So, uh, and at some point, this evolved into um, um, uh, an image or animation blog that I called the Daily Drawbot. For a while, it was daily, and after that, it's just something. Um, or rather, my collection of homemade screensavers. You saw when you entered the room, that was the, one of the last ones. So uh, it started in uh, December 2015 on Tumblr, and by now it, ha it has grown to about 110 animated GIFs. The continuity, questionable. Um, but why? Well, there, there, was, um, there was one particular thing. At some point I had made this in, in like a, an idle moment with Drawbot, and it turned out it was, it was a fairly simple program that I wrote, and it had this uh, intricate output that looks 3D, it looks, it's moving, in a, in a, it has this material kind of feel, um, yet the program is literally, 
35 lines long. So it's really not all that complicated. If, uh, if you already know a little bit of Python and you want to know, uh, uh, um, there is, at, at my final slide, we'll go some, get some links. I have a, a page on GitHub show, uh, with some uh, example source codes. But there's also, I have one screencast on Vimeo that uh, explains how to write this specific thing. And I think it's a video of about, about 18 minutes long. So if you're curious about that, you, uh, some basic knowledge of Python is kind of assumed. Um, but then, uh, yeah. So yeah, that, that's kind of how I would start it. And I made a couple more things like it. So actually, you see here a simplified version. And it's just some squares that are squeezed together and uh, drawn from left to right. And they overlap each other. And something is rotated in just the right way until the end. And then, well, yeah. Uh, and then animated. And so I was kind of surprised myself by the, uh, how effective this was and how much fun it looked and how much fun it was to make for me. Um, so yeah, so I kind of got into this and started making more and more and looked again into the GIF or GIF file format, um, which is very old and it has very bad compression and has a maximum of 256 colors. Um, I think that recently the 30th birthday of the format was, was celebrated somehow, but it supports animation or some, similar, some primitive form of it. Um, so uh, the animated GIF format, and that's kind of cool. It's, it's a very, uh, its appeal lies into that it's a very simple format. Uh, um, it's relatively easy to produce by software. Um, it has this animated feature that by default loops, so it, and it has no sound. So it's kind of this mini video thing that became really popular. I don't know exactly when. Uh, I'm sure social media uh, scientists can, with, okay, then and then this became repopularized. Well, Tumblr was one of the platforms where GIFs were just going crazy. Um, so now I think uh, uh, that's so bad that, e that just any kind of looping animation is just called a GIF, whether it's technically a GIF or not. So, um, but yeah, so I was, uh, um, so I posted first before I went to Tumblr, I created a few, created a few more things and people say, hey, you should uh, collect them somewhere at a place. Uh, so like, like a Tumblr, I said, hmm, Tumblr, what is that? Uh, so I started this blog there. Um, okay. Um, and then, yeah, what, what's on Tumblr that is, uh, there's some crazy stuff going on. That's, uh, <laughs> kids I'm sure understand it's, uh, for me as an old guy, it was kind of, so yeah, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting subculture, uh, the whole GIF thing. But yeah, uh, uh, making some things. And you know, on, a, a little bit more about the GIF format. Uh, so it's very limited. Tumblr is also limited. Um, like, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but uh, uh, like up until a year ago at least, and maybe still, your files, your GIF file could not be larger than two megabytes, which is pretty small. And so you, you're, the length of your animation is limited and the resolution is limited and you kind of have to think that maybe also your frame rate should be limited. You, can, you will not maybe upload 60 frames per second animation because that would just be too much data. Uh, also, Tumblr likes images that are 500 by 500, or uh, so, I don't know. So I started making things and later I realized that I was, there were some, uh, some themes um, that I was playing with, simple graphic stuff. Well, you, you'll see examples of this. I, I, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go through all this so much. Um, but one of the things that, that, that I was fascinated with is like to create the perfect loop. Like within video, I think it's actually a challenge for people who are making GIFs out of actual live video to create this loopy thing and that's of course hard that it loops. Well, if you, if you make things with algorithms and code, then you just have to think properly and like, like that the, the last frame connects li nicely back to your first frame and once you have the logic of that correct, then your thing loops perfectly. But there's different, so I'm, I've been playing with different approaches to that. So the, um, uh, you will see examples of those kinds of things. Now, to do animation in Drawbot. Drawbot is not really an animation program. It's really, you give instructions and it draws something. And okay, you can actually give more instructions and it draws something else on a second page. And then you can give more instructions and it will draw something on a third page maybe. And now what if we don't call it pages but frames and instead saving it as a multi-page PDF, we save it as uh, an animated GIF. Well, that's kind of how it works. So Drawbot 
it just allows you to draw simple things. It's kind of primitive, but to make things move, you have to think about how should it move, and you have to uh, calculate the numbers. Like if you just want to move some, make something move from left to right, well, then you have your x coordinate that progressively, progressively has to go to the right. You have to well, so all these things you have to just you have to do the math behind that. Some are simple, some can be more complicated. Um, but it's this really bare bones thing. It doesn't like in the professional animation software, you have these in betweens and, and smooth easing in and easing out. That's all not there. And that's kind of what I like about it because then I really have to make it myself. So whatever comes out feels like it's really mine. I don't know. So it's, uh, it's a little bit um, Spartanic, maybe. Uh, uh, <laughs> also, there is no 3D in Drawbot, yet I've been, some of my things are quite 3D, so like, uh, like this, the, the example I showed earlier, the, the rotated squares, it gives the illusion of 3D. Um, so anyway, so there's different, uh, so also yeah, this, uh, so th this was an early, early one. I will now start going through a whole bunch of these things that if you followed me, there might not be much new in there. But how this was done, okay, there's a lot of kind of, fair, this is actually the exact same script with slightly different settings. It's the same algorithm. Um, and this also, and it's all uh, this also, slightly different color, and then this is the slide that explains how it works. This is uh, something that I saw online, um, and I thought, hmm, I understand that, <laughs> and I can take something, do something with this. So it's a grid of circles, and on each circle there is a dot, and each circle can move individually, and they're kind of moved in, well, there's different phases to it. So they, they're they kind of shifted uh, in their rotation, and then everything moves together, and then those dotted lines, if you then connect them in certain ways, then uh, literally this is what you get. So again, there's no 3D involved here. Um, um, just it's, it's this very simple thing that I didn't even invent. I just took it and made it look nice. So that's uh, what happens uh, a lot of times. Um, okay, and I did many more or less uh, uh, flat graphic things with some patterny kind of things here. This this turned out looking like a magnet. Um, kind of the, the individual shapes try to follow this point that is circling circling uh, along the thing. Make yourself go dizzy. Um, well, yeah, this. Uh, was Probably also shouldn't look at this too long. <laughs> um, anyway, some some relatively simple graphic patterns. Um, yeah, this this, this was uh, I, I made this, and I was searching for something else, and this was kind of a sketch towards that. And I'm not entirely sure. You know, I was uh, um, yeah, I was thinking in terms of the Escher kind of patterns, like how the birds and fishes go together. You might know those. And um, I somehow didn't figure it out. I still meant to continue with it, because it's, it's interesting how those patterns work, and you can do math on them. But anyway, I was trying something really simple. But then when I saw this, I kind of looked, at, it looked like fish scales. So I thought, hmm, instead of those straight lines, if I can make them nice and smooth, it will look like actual fish, scale, fish scales. So that's what I did. And so, with this, so it just, I just accidentally kind of bumped into this. So you discover things by just trying things out. and. Uh, yeah. Well, this is some Bezier curves that interpolate in some way and together make this uh, net-like structure. Um, also, more uh, quadratic Bezier curves for the type nerds among you. This is thanks to the true type curve system with quadratic curves, and it is a, it is an easy way to make blobby kind of shapes based on only a few points and then moving them around, and it's, this gave me a jellyfish. Um, okay, this is the, the stacked, for, it's almost the same, and it became this, well, fleshy kind of thing. I don't know, it's always a little, uh, or a bone, I don't know. It's, uh, it's uh, many things I will not have much to say about, so <laughs> I will just. I would just let you enjoy the screensaver. Let's look at screensavers all night. <laughs> anyway, something with sine waves or a knitting pattern almost. I don't know. This, uh, but it, I felt it always a nice challenge to make these continuous loops. Like, okay, the, 
the, the bumper images are getting more complicated, the uh, wireframe. What I like about these is that you can't really tell what's front and what is back, and you can look at them two ways, and like it's one perspective or another, and both are equally right. Anyway, so at some point I, I tried to do some things that also gave the illusion of 3D by pretty much just layering things properly. So that was a trick I, I started using. So actually what is being, so I'm still using all the flat drawbot drawing instructions. This is just drawing some vertical lines with a stroke and a round line cap on them. And they move in a, in a way, but uh, they're sorted from back to front. So they're drawn in the right order, despite the rotation. And yeah, I can give them some color. And this was a very, fairly simple effect that proved rather, um, effective in, in its appearance. So more fake 3D. Well, it's actually started to in, include a little more. I slowly moved towards doing some actual 3D math, uh, uh, learning online like how to rotate three-dimensional coordinates and stuff. So that's something that Drawbot doesn't do out of the box, but I wrote my own stuff to, to do that. So there's, uh, oh, yeah, this is another one that actually involves no 3D math at all. This is, um, this is a bunch of ellipses drawn from the bottom to the top and from dark gray to light gray. And by just calculating the size in a certain way, you get this, this blobby, uh, as if it's a smoke-filled um, uh, soap bubble. And slightly different settings, same thing. This, I used to have an, a pink version of this slide to make a Barba Papa reference, but I was afraid that wouldn't work. Uh, I don't know if that reference works in, in the US. But Barba Papa is kind of the thing. Okay, more uh, um, 3D kind of things. Um, played with wireframe. Well, now we're getting really into the realm of actual 3D things, so that's maybe a little less interesting because this kind of imagery you can just easily produce in actual 3D software. But I kind of found it interesting to learn how this stuff works, and especially about the triangulation. Of the, uh, we'll talk about that a little further. Um, I had a sneak preview of the TDC show that will be open next week, and there's, there's an image in there that really kind of uses this principle. I didn't see that, but it's... Uh, but then in a, in a smoother way. I'm sure this has been reinvented many times over, but it's kind of a digital looking thing. It was my New Year's, uh, New Year's greeting for, well, 2016, I suppose. Um, all right, this is my psychedelic donut number one. Um, also, I'll go to the next version. This was related to it, and if you look at it a certain way, it really gets this 3D-ish image, as if it's really a donut. Um, and well, I think this one even more so. This is actually the exact same as the previous one, with slightly different settings. Just more of the the, the bubbles. Um, yeah, some math, lots of sine, cosine, and uh, playing around, and all of a sudden and making colors react to certain numbers. Uh, um, sometimes people respond on, uh, on Twitter. So that was, uh, <laughs> I like Tal Lemming's uh, reply to that. He's a colleague coder, obviously. He likes the code itself. Anyway, so typographic snow. Uh, this is uh, actually an example of another kind of perfect loop. Um, you probably don't see it at first how this works, and it's a continuous thing, but the loop itself is actually relatively short. It repeats, if you look at a certain position, you will see the same snowflake appear again and again. But they all, they kind of fade in, they drop for a while and they fade out, uh, but they're all shifted in time. And if I now move my pointer, you can see the timeline of the animation actually going, so you see how short it actually is. It's about uh, uh, two seconds at most. Two, three seconds, four, whatever, I can't even read. Anyway, so this is, this is a technique to make things loop in a non-obvious way. Um, all right, similarly, um, I tried to re-render this in high HD, but ran into a, a, a dropout bug today, which Frederick immediately fixed, but then I didn't have time to re-render this after all. Anyway, so, uh, right, um, finally, math. This, this is an, uh, an image that is uh, a, a photo of, of a board that is, I, I think it's larger than what I can point. It's, it's not as large as what you see on screen, but 
uh, more than half of it. It's from my favorite museum in the world, which happens to be in my hometown in Harlem. It's called Tyler's Museum. And it's kind of a museum of museums because it's it, uh, apparently, it, at least it might be the, the oldest museum in the world that has been built as a museum. And um, the, the founder collected all these um, uh, scientific uh, measuring things uh, from scientists and, and telescopes and all kinds of things. So they also have a huge collection of fossils and, uh, and stones, uh, uh, crystals, but like this really nicely made brass uh, telescopes and measuring things. Um, from like 80th, 18th century, uh, um, well, it's it's pretty nice. If you're ever in the Netherlands, and you have, uh, it's 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 a cool, it's small, but it's it's kind of a cool museum. It's unique. Um, how, uh, however, about this image, uh, this is an illustration of the so-called Lissajou curve, um, and they actually built this thing you see at the top. There was there are two tuning forks, and somehow they attached two little mirrors on it. And, uh, well, they didn't have laser beams yet, but they tried to make this beam of light that would go reflect on both uh, tuning forks, and then they would hit both tuning forks and then look at what the shape of the, what the, shape the projection would be. Turns out you get shapes like this, depending on the frequency re relationship and the phase ratio. So the top row, um, the frequency ratio is just one-on-one, -on -one, same frequency, just a different phase. Uh, you get different shapes. Um, so um, at some point I rebuilt that. Uh, so this is another kind of an illustration of this effect. So you have pretty much what this comes down to, and we'll come back to this in a later section of the talk. Um, you have a sine wave that you use to control uh, your x value, and you have another sine wave that you use to control your y value. And you plot them out in time, and then roughly this is what you get. Um, so I kind of used that principle to make some other drawbots. Uh, so this is going from one thing to, to another. Um, so that, that was a principle. You know, I've actually um, been playing with this. I heard about this Lissajou curve when I was fairly young and was fascinated, have been fascinated by it, by it ever since. Um, so Lissajou screensavers. Um, another bit of math, this is a visualization of the so-called Euler spiral. Um, interesting bit of math that I cannot really explain. You know, I'm, uh, on the one hand, I'm quite good at math. I seem to have uh, some talent for it, but I n do not have a really thorough uh, education in it. So I always feel like mm, I'm lacking all this, this uh, theoretical background. So. Um, this uh, is a spiral mapped on a sphere where I found some, some JavaScript code of someone who did that and I kind of like, hmm, that's looking interesting. How can we uh, rebuild that in Python? And uh, then you think, well, may, how can we make it look this, how, how come does it, that it looks so dimensional, that it looks like a thick material? Uh, well, that's all faked actually. So uh, this is all drawn with small circles that are drawn from back to front in the right color, so from darker to lighter. And the next version, here you see the individual circles. So this is the same thing with just far fewer circles rendered. So here you can actually see the individual circles, circles in some stage. But that is how it was drawn. Right? So it's completely, and all the, the, yeah, so there's some 3D math, like how to, how to calculate a point on a sphere. Well, lots of sine and cosine going on. Um, I had this fascination with spheres for a while, so or in disco balls, other mathematical shapes. I'm just trying around uh, here. I was really trying to learn how to, to work with three-dimensional coordinates more. Um, there's still lots to learn more. This is kind of a, a five-edged Mobius ring. Anyway, and this was inspired by this gravitational waves discovery of um, a year and a half ago or something. Um, also, um, so there is some 3D math behind it, but an, an additional trick that I saw somewhere and forgot to note the reference, so I, I don't know who I st whom I stole it from. So there is um, a, a grid of white dots, and by making them larger and slightly more transparent, depending on where you are, you can give the illusion of this field of depth of field effect. Right? So that's all that's happening. In the middle, the dots are just solid white, and more to the front, they become 
transparent and larger, and to the back as well. So there's no blurring on, on sharpness. It's all, uh, this, is, this, is, this is it. So it's a very, very cheap effect in a way. Okay, more math. This is a so-called Pythagoras tree. It's not invented by Pythagoras, but by a, a Dutch math teacher, I think in the 40s or, or something. Um, and it's called that because it has uh, the theorem of, of Pythagoras in there. Let me see. Well, I'll just walk there because I, um, it's right here. So here's the triangle. So uh, if you, this is a, cor uh, a corner, an angle of 90 degrees. To calculate this, you have to take this, uh, this, this, the square of this distance, which is represented by this square, add it to the square of this distance, represented by this square. Together is the square of this distance, represented by that rectangle. Now, uh, so this is invented before they had, uh, I mean, that, that guy, I'm sure he didn't have a computer at home in the 40s, uh, yet he figured this out somehow. You, you can kind of see where this is going. Like, you start with a large square at the, at the bottom and you add like this roof to it and you add two more squares and now each of those squares you treat the exact same way. It's now smaller, you add a triangle, add two. So with every step, two more squares are added. So this is, uh, uh, like I said, a, a fairly old uh, idea. But of course, computers are really good at calculating these kind of things. So this is, this is an illustration I found on the internet, but I made my own interpretations uh, of it. For instance, this is one that moves, where the angle changes, and it becomes this broccoli or cauliflower thing. That's just, um, but you can recognize the thing in there, and there has to be a limit. You know, you cannot make this go indefinitely, because it would take forever, uh, well, literally forever. Um, right for every step. Uh, so with these kind of algorithms, these so-called recursive algorithms, you um, you have to put a break into it you, you, because, like with every step, the number of squares that are drawn doubles. So the first time it's one, in the second uh, iteration it's two, then it's four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. You see, with each step, this grows really fast. So, um, right, the more complex or the more detailed you want this to be drawn, the longer the computer will have to calculate this. Okay, this is kind of a 3D version. It's, n it's the same principle, it's a, the, um, a recursive thing, um, except like a stick will not spawn two uh, squares, it will spawn four more sticks or three or it's uh, there's some random numbers involved um, so uh, it can and, and also the lengths are different um, so and it's just rotating around I think the next version it should somehow be uh, in the wind or something it's uh, feels a little so this is the zoomed in thing that I posted this morning it's a little you have to look careful for what what is front and what is back if you don't see that and you can see it turning two ways if you don't look the right way so it can be really confusing to, lo to look at I like that. Anyway, more math. There is, ah, I wanted to look up the inventor of this thing. There's something called pinwheel tiling. I think there's a Wikipedia page about it which will document its inventor. Um, there, uh, there's this, this specific triangle which uh, has these proportions. It's one by two and then the diagonal will be the square root of five. Um, this particular Triangle, you can divide into one, two, three, four, five new triangles, which all have the exact same proportions. And they're mirrored a little bit. Um, and it's uh, so, I, I, I think I, if I understood correctly, this is the, the only triangle in existence that has this property that you can divide in this particular way. Now you can imagine, so now we have this one triangle, we divide it into four triangles that are identical in proportions, but look also, they have interestingly different angles, how they are placed on the, uh, on the screen. Uh, so for each triangle, you could do the same thing again. So also, this is an example of a possibly recursive algorithm. Um, so that's what this tries to show. It's, uh, so it could go in, uh, indefinitely into the distance, uh, the, the, the gray scales make it a little hard to discern, but you, the, all those triangles, you can see the pattern in there, and I will now hypnotize. <laughs> um, so this is now an endless zoom, and it will, like, after a, a certain rotation, it's actually back in the original state, so it's, again, a loop, right? And this is the length of the loop. It's also remarkably short, actually. It still took a long time to render because there's just so many triangles in here. 
All right. Um, this is another. This is a very nice example. This this one is called the Sierpinski Square or Sierpinski Sieve or uh, what's the proper name? Um, um, a very simple recursive algorithm. You start with a square, the big one, that, uh, and you divide it into three by three. Now the rule is that the middle square you will just color black, and then the eight remaining squares you will apply the same rules. So that's. Where that goes. Also, this is go. This is an example also of a fractal image. It goes. You can zoom in indefinitely. So this will indeed go on like this. I, uh, I, the code for this I took from Peter from Blockland, who, who posted this, and I improved it a little bit uh, to make it loop a little better. All right. More math. Um, at some point, I discovered this thing actually from a, 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 several years ago. A, a student of mine in, in, at KBK, graphic design student, he was playing with some processing stuff, and he found this library uh, that w uh, would create uh, so-called uh, Voronoi tessellation patterns. And I was, hmm, never heard of that. What is that? And much later, I looked it up. And um, let me see if I can explain. So you have this pattern. The dots is, your, is, is a bunch of random points. And the lines are drawn that within each tile, if you call it a tile, all the points within that tile are the closest to its original, that, that point in it. It cannot be closer to any other point. That is how the division is made. So you can kind of see, uh, so between these two points, well, there will be this straight line that's perpendicular to that thing. So that's kind of, so based on, given um, those random point, points, you can calculate this pattern. Um, the math behind that is possibly quite complex, but I found some library code that actually does it, so I didn't have to do that. Um, okay, uh, on the other hand, this is another principle, the so-called Delaunay triangulation. Also, starting from a set of random points, there's certain rules to create triangles that I can now not phrase as nicely. But anyway, the two, uh, th those, those two things, the Voronoi and the Lonay uh, things have been in, uh, 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 discovered independently, but they're actually the same thing. Uh, they overlay like this. The green dots here are your sample points. The, the, the magenta lines are the triangulation and the blue lines are the Voronoi. Tessellation, so they they have a very clear relationship to each other to each other, and I kind of found these shapes fascinating, both the triangulation as well as the Voronoi uh, stuff. So I started playing with that. Um, this would be I, I I took a bunch of random numbers and moved them around in in subtle ways, and for each frame would calculate have this library code calculate the triangulation, and because of the different distances, it's uh, the the rules well. This is done according to the Delaunay, Delaunay algorithm rule. So if you change the point configuration, well, the, the lines to be drawn are different. So you get these funny little sudden switches, whereas much of the rest uh, kind of stays connected. So I found this a really fascinating kind of movement. Um, it almost felt biological. So I added some rounded corners here and there. Same principle, just visualize it differently. And all of a sudden, it may even look like brain cells or something or whatever. It started to look more and more biological. So triangulation. This is kind of a similar thing, but now applied on the Voronoi thing. So instead of drawing the straight lines, I also have for each corner uh, adds a bit of round corner. And of, because of the same things you see, this, now these things almost look like cells or that, that move among each other. And then suddenly I got a celebrity retweet, which is kind of cool. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a guitarist of, uh, of, of Living Color that I've been uh, uh, listening to since the 90s or something. So I, I knew immediately who this was. I'm like, whoa, dude. So anyway, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> anyway, trying to overlay, overlay those two things. This is a, a little trial, but this was my final thing, overlaying the Delaunay triangulation with the Voronoi. Tessellation, and I kind of like this. Uh, yeah, it could come alive at some point, maybe. All right, but sometimes the inspiration comes from something mundane as a saucer on Kara's kitchen table, and uh, so she was saying, "Hey, isn't that like a robot kind of thing?" Like, I said, yeah, maybe. Yeah, so it's a 
I, somehow the next day I uh, was thinking, oh, okay, that's actually a fascinating shape. What can we do with that? And actually first I made something um, that was based on this one particular leaf uh, and it turned out like this. And I added some 3D stuff to it and it somehow became something completely different. And I thought, you know, okay, it came from that idea to do that, but now it's becoming this. But Kara saw it and like, hey, that's my saucer. I was kind of like, how did you even see that, the connection there? But I think she was kind of knew where it was going. Uh, and actually, I did something that was a little closer to the saucer uh, after all. So this became this uh, kind of rotating Bézier, Bézier flower thing that had this uh, really soothing effect on everyone. <sighs> anyway, so sometimes you just trying with some sine waves and uh, amplitudes and uh, this was originally uh, done as a plotter test. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the, 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 the video footage of it, but I did a workshop in Basel a few months ago and the guy who invited me over, uh, Ted Davis, had an actual plotter there and we hooked it up to Drawbot and managed to control this physical plotter and this was kind of a quick script, like, okay, let's draw a bunch of lines. Um, but then later, of course, I had to make it move anyway. Um, okay, more fairly, okay, this is a little typographic, there's a bunch of O's in there, is there a bit of obsidian in there maybe, I don't know. Um, anyway, obscenity for sure. So it's, um, all right, um, here I was trying to place a, a square into a sphere and then calculate some additional points and it turned out to be this thing which rotates all kinds of directions. It's pretty hard to follow where it's going, which uh, well, originally I had it all in white, but it's kind of nice to have this gray. So I have this kind of depth information as a 3D coordinate and kind of make the colors derive from that. Um, but then I thought, okay, this, uh, what this is, is um, a cube that rotates in two ways into a sphere and kind of leaves traces on the sphere, and then that whole image with the traces is rotating. So that's kind of what's, whatever. Uh, this was also, yeah, I should have the, the, the Twitter reference. There was someone writing a tiny program for this, this uh, like tiny computer that is the beginning of a game, and I kind of took that algorithm and turned it into this uh, tunnel e thing. Oh, right, I s was it at the Lubalan Center also at the exhibition where there was an, a typographic image which kind of, no, it was at uh, the Lubalan Center. There's a poster that does something like this, but then with type, really nice. So, okay, at a small range of experiments where I would uh, have this uh, um, uh, grid of shapes. So this one, this starts with a grid of triangles and make them rotate in a way while they stay connected somehow and the grid will just have to grow. Um, same principles with square has turned out to become this. So these lozenges turning into other squares. I think there's the, the Dropbox logo is hidden in there somehow. <laughs> um, and this is one more time the same thing with hexagons. So it's this puzzle that comes together and then dissolves again, sometimes leaving. I think at some point I should do some study into Islamic patterns. There's a lot of interesting uh, ge uh, geometrical math going on there. So that is really cool stuff to check out. Okay, uh, from two-dimensional patterns, I tried a three-dimensional pattern. What, what I tried to do here is uh, I tried to visualize in my head, I have a box full of golf balls and they're stacked as tightly as possible. There's some math behind that, what is the closest possible thing. And now we glue them all together and we kind of will, will sand off a flat surface. And then that's what you see. And now we're calculating that uh, from different angles as if we did that several times. So you kind of see golf balls being sanded off while the inside of golf balls um, presumably is not white. I'm sure Mike Essel will be able to tell us that with his golf ball. Uh, but yeah, um, and the 3D effect, you know, just, they're just grayer circles just by calculating the gray level. This is a stack of circles drawn, so there's not really much 3D going on. But I did some math on the actual spheres, like how do you intersect a sphere with a plane? 
So I learned something here. Now, oftentimes, this is really, these are little exercises for me to, to learn certain aspects of math that I may or may not be able to use later for other things. Anyway, at some point, three-dimensional scribble. Um, the cool thing about this is that I realized there's a, so uh, I pretty much, th there's a bunch of random three-dimensional coordinates, and I treat those as if uh, there should be a line drawn along, uh, as again, with a true-type quadratic Bezier curve-ish kind of thing. The cool thing is once you do the projection, when you, once you rotate those coordinates, and if you then just delete, get rid of your Z coordinates, and you end up with just a set of X, Y coordinates, and you draw this, then that's actually what you get. So this is all drawn in 2D. Um, there's, uh, so to how those curves react to the transformations, it's a little hard to explain, but the, I, I didn't really have to, to implement 3D. Uh, Bezier curves for this at all. It's uh, just take a bunch of 3D coordinates, rotate them around, throw away the Z coordinates, and then draw your scribble as if it's just a two-dimensional thing. And the three-dimensional effect um, is, is kind of, um, well, was, 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 looked a lot better than I anticipated. Um, okay, more patterns. Let's see where we're going. A next chapter. We're not done with the... All right, and then there was a certain category of things that I posted on the Daily Drawbot that were kind of reactions to things I saw online. So this was a photo that uh, Benjamin Shakin took of a work from Lisa Maioni. Um, and uh, he tagged her, but I didn't... Uh, she's a former student of mine at Type at Cooper Condensed, but I didn't know her Instagram tag, so I didn't even realize what her, what it was her work at first. So this was apparently done in some analog way. It's a poster. Uh, she had some this lenticular glass thing with, which has a certain profile, and then if you overlay that on something, you get an effect like this. And um, yeah, you take a nice picture, and there's your poster. So that's, uh, that's a cool thing. Apparently, as we'll see later, that has been done in the past several times over. But I saw this, and I thought, hmm, that's a striking kind of repetition. And I kind of saw how it was done. You kind of see there's an, an each stripe, there's actually a part of the letter that is upside down, right? So you can follow the letter that, if you follow that A, you see part segments of that letter, and it's upside down. So I thought, hmm, that's how it's done. So I kind of reprogrammed that with slightly different settings and made it move, because how can this not move almost, right? That's sometimes, uh, sometimes my trigger, like, hey, this is a great image. Why doesn't it move? Well, I make it move. So, um, but here you, you, here you can literally see, if you just follow one band, you will see that entire A passing by upside down. Um, it's pretty much all there is to it. I mean, the original has some nice analog qualities because of the way it was done, and this is, of course, very hard. Um, by the way, this is also a nice example of a repetition, a, a perfect loop that is actually remarkably short because the entire loop exists in, from uh, if, one, if a band moves the distance of one band up, that's the entire loop. I will show you the duration. There it goes. So this is all there is to it. It's uh, re repeating right there. You can, if you look properly, you can actually see that. But since it has this nice continuing, continuous effect, um, it's, it's easy to overlook at first. Anyway, so then uh, Sasha, or should I say the Lubalan Center, posted this uh, uh, on their Twitter, which is... Um, Interesting, this is a piece from the late 60s. Um, it's from a catalog for, an ex for a show by Peter Struiken, who is this really um, ahead, of, ahead of his time uh, art, Dutch artist who worked a lot with computers really early on. Um, and this uh, catalog was designed by Wim Krowell and a co-worker whose name I uh, uh, am ashamed to have forgotten now. So, uh, uh, and actually this, this pattern is not it, it's, it's designed for the catalog. It's not even a piece by Peter Struiken, as far as I understand. It's kind of, it's, I think it responds to the show that this was a catalog for. But yeah, um, doesn't this look like something that should move? Well, I was not the only one who thought so. So uh, um, at that point, former student, as well as future student, Tom Janssen, he just graduated at Type Media, but this was before, this was in between. I also had him as a student, as a graphic designer. So he... Uh, Tell us me, will we see you tomorrow? And he's a little annoying, this guy. <laughs> but, you know, I could not resist the challenge. So, 
there we go. Uh, let's see, this, this was the moving version. And it was relative, I also, I saw the logic of the pattern, and actually the pattern lent itself to be animated in this way all by itself. It was laid out, if you look at the original, um, it's really, um, wait, uh, um, even the, 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 the two pages are pretty much two different phases in the same thing, if you see it as an animation. I think I should double check that, but I think both pages pretty much will occur as a frame in my animation. So that's how naturally, natural, how th this, this particular pattern lends itself to just animate. It's, uh, it's so logical. So that was both easy as fun and, uh, and looks nice. So. It has this really like almost unexpected kind of movement that you can kind of see suggested in the in the static version, but to see it actually move uh, was kind of neat. So then, Sasha probably having responded to a scene like, "Hey, that that space thing, um, I've seen that before. Can you confirm that, Sasha? Is that how it went?" That's he, he nods over there. All right. So he went into the archives and found this stuff from 1959. Uh, showing that this lenticular stuff has been done way before. I think it was later, there was an even earlier example or something, I forgot. But this, uh, so this is a um, pretty neat effect, but it's, it's been reinvented several times over. Um, and then, of course, someone would say, Nick Sherman in this case, <laughs> how long do you think, of, okay, can I take this, I cannot not take this challenge, damn it. <laughs> so, it took me 33 minutes, I was kind of proud of that. So, there, there we go. It's not the same, but it's the same principle, right? I mean, I kind of, Picked uh, an arbitrary, kind of arbitrary other typeface, kind of match the color. I like this sentence. It's kind of this Dr. Seuss-y kind of, kind of phrase. I'm not even sure where it's coming from. All right, and over the course of posting all this stuff on Facebook and Twitter and blah, 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 um, uh, some people said, hey, have you seen this? Or uh, have you heard of that? Reminds me of that. And I was, no. Turns out that Marcel Duchamp in 1926 um, made this. Um, I'll let it run for a little bit. Um, pretty much he created these circular patterns that he would just put on a turntable-like device and just film it. And they were designed in such a small way, that it, in such a smart way, that, you, that it kind of appears as if those circles are moving in some way. Um, but it's actually just a static image that rotates in this case. And also, if you look closely, you just kind of see a spiral. There is no spiral. It's just how the circles are placed uh, to each other. So there's a couple more. That this is a longer. I will not go through the entire thing. But there were a couple of ex examples, and I thought, hmm, that's pretty cool. Marcel Duchamp would have liked robots in 1926. <laughs> so um, yeah, here likewise. So this this totally looks dynamic, as if it's moving, but uh, um, it's not. It's just it's just a rotating platter. So, of course, this had to be redone. So this is the first one. Like, as I tried to remake it as, as closely as possible and just rotate it. But while making this, trying to figure out like, what are the rules, how those circles are placed. I mean, it's all, of course, I, I, I will not go in and move those circles manually. I want to figure out the logic behind it. So that's what I did. Otherwise, it's no fun for me. Uh, but here, there's this, this is a version that I'm sure Marcel Duchamp would have liked, but this is actually moving. So this was actually derived from the same code. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it, kind of neat. So it just goes on and on. So, <laughs> anyway, which reminded me of uh, paintings by Victor Vasarely from either the 60s or early 70s. While well, he had a pretty long career, um, the, one of the important uh, op art uh, people uh, making these things. Uh, well, th th this one, yeah, I mean, it was already so close to what I was doing with the Duchamp things that uh, to make this one move was. Uh, almost too easy, but the, 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 the three-dimensional effect of it, uh, well, I was surprised by how, by how effective the simple, it's pretty much playing, so again, figuring out the rules, how, what are the rules behind this, how are the circles placed, and then just play with the numbers over time, and it's pretty much so, um, as far as I'm concerned, Victor Fasorelli invented this uh, animation, I just played with the numbers a little bit. Anyway, so he also made a whole bunch of these things. The, the, the funny thing is I don't even, 
I, I find these relatively ugly in color and stuff. But um, uh, as a very young boy, my parents took me on vacation to France, and at some point we were in a, were in a town, and there was a museum um, um, that was either dedicated to him or it was had a show for him. So as a, like a five-year-old or something, I've seen things like this for real, and they were huge. And I still don't know what I thought about it then, but it's the, the images, they, they will not go away, right? So this... It's uh, um, so well. Okay, so now I try to like figure out a little bit of the math behind that, do a reinterpretation of that, try a couple of things to make that move, have this kind of lens-ish kind of effect that I didn't take all that far beyond this actually, but uh, it was nice to figure out some lens math, color them. So here I didn't, I didn't really want to. You know, I actually was too lazy to go all the way and make, really remake a painting exactly. So it was a little more complicated than that. Another painting, I forgot how I got into this. Yeah, of, of course, Ellsworth Kelly, he, he passed away uh, um, early in 2016 or midway through. And I'd known several of his paintings, but I looked online somehow and I found this one that I ha actually hadn't seen before. And this is a pixel painting from 1951. And apparently has, he has had really rules figured out how to construct this with using some sort of random numbers or rolling a die, whatever. Uh, um, um, so, well, uh, this is a slightly more close up uh, um, uh, reproduction of that, that painting. Um, and of course, I had to try and reproduce that. Um, later, I read a description somewhere how it was actually done and I realized that I, I had not really, I just, kind of reverse engineer it and did something that looked close enough. But later I found someone who uh, uh, um, had, there's some documentation how he actually did it. And I did it a little bit wrong and I meant to go back at it and, and fix it. Um, it will not look all that different, but uh, it was kind of the, the, the more interesting challenge for me was to make this one loop also uh, without seeing any kind of cut. Right, so it's, it appears to be a random things, and that's what it is, but you have to like, do it in a very subtle way. If it's all just random, then it will be random forever, and you cannot just loop it, because then you'll suddenly jump into this other state. So that was my challenge here. Anyway, and then there were some, some uh, tributes to graphic design, like Jonathan Barnbrook did this uh, stuff for David Bowie, which was really strong, and uh, well, he made this kind of the, the things at the bottom. You probably know, but they're they're representing letters. It says Bowie down there. Um, but he made these shapes like pretty much using all the combinations, like take that star and just turning uh, the the corners on or off. So I made a little animation that kind of uh, goes through all the possibilities. It's two to the power of five. So it's uh, how much is that? That's I think 32 possibilities. It's not even that much. Anyway, the, the, not super exciting. But he also, I think for one of the singles, uh, he designed this thing, uh, which looked already a little bit more like, hmm, it looks like interesting math behind that. And it turns out this is based on the visualization of gravity around a, uh, a, a, an object, maybe like a, a planet. Like, actually, I found this one online. It's pretty much directly inspired by this. So by, uh, by uh, Thing, tribute to his thing, I kind of, well, I don't know, I, I didn't feel all too guilty because he kind of took it from this, so I took it from him. Uh, so I, I, I kind of took that pattern and uh, tried to make it move. It was a little less exciting than I ho was hoping for, but still, it's something. Anyway, classic. This has been a famous album, Unknown Pleasures, by, by Joy Division from 1979. Uh, Apparently, one of the band members just picked this image out of an encyclopedia, and Peter Saville, all he did was making it negative and placing it on this black uh, uh, record sleeve, and that became one of the most iconic record albums covers ever, I suppose. If you look for it, um, many people have made animated versions of it. Um, so I did one. Uh, uh, it's yeah. What I kind of like about the original is that you can kind of see that it's reproduced from something. It's a little rough. Well, that's pretty hard to replicate, so this is my interpretation of that. It's a little clean, perhaps. Um, the most, uh, uh, what it actually visualizes is some measurements of, um, of a certain star system, of the, um, 
Um, uh, some poles are, they, they, there are some scientific measurements, the original at least. Um, and the hardest part for me to, visual, to recreate this one is to create fake data that would kind of make this graph. You can see it has every now and then these interesting spikes that it's not completely random. And you see here uh, in the original, like there's really funny spikes every now and then that are not all that uh, regular. So anyway, this was a case I saw an announcement for a, a typographic circle event in London that had something to do with a company called uh, the, the Motion Picture Company or something. And it turns out this is their logo. And it, they're called the Motion Picture Company or something. And it doesn't move. <laughs> how, how can that be? It can't just. So I had to do that. I, I, I kind of wrote in the description, they, they, they should buy it from me. I never heard, of course, but uh, I don't even know who designed the logo, to be honest, but uh, it's kind of a neat logo. I, I like how it's constructed. It, once I figured, it out, figured out, there's really some circles in there. It's cleverly uh, put together, and it lends itself really easily for movement. All right. I think there's another chapter coming. I'm talking with Right. There will be a little sub-lecture now, um, a, a talk that I've done before last year. I will it will be, I'm sure it will be different because I do not really keep to a script. So uh, I did an experiment last year. Uh, uh, think back of the Lisa Zhu. The Lisa Zhu stuff will come back. I will, for now, actually, I will test the sound in the system. We'll be hearing some sounds. Okay. There's a test sound. Is it, does it go to, from left to right a little bit? Kind of works, right? Anyway, it should be stereo, but if it's not, it's, it's fine. Okay, so there will be some sound. But... First, so I, I, I will be talking about the relationship to, between sound and shapes. And then we have the circle and the sine wave. Uh, the circle being the simple most shape, that is, or maybe the, the most basic shape in existence. I don't know if we can say that. The sine wave is the most elementary sound that exists. There is no simpler sound. Uh, more basic It's like the building block of all other sounds. All other sounds can be seen as uh, a juxtaposition of many sine waves. And, well, shape, a sound, they're both, the, uh, the circle is a circle, the sine wave is based on a circle. Like, if you go around a circle, and now let's look at that, that horizontal line that moves up and down, if we would plot that out as a function of the, uh, the, the angle, then we'll get a nice sine curve. So that is how uh, the sine wave works. You go around a circle and you plot out the thing. This is Okay, you can do the same for the x. There's a, uh, that would be the cosine. Uh, actually, uh, similarly in principle, this is a, a visualization I took, uh, uh, found online, so I didn't make this one, but it nicely visualizes the relationship between going around a circle and the sine wave. And if it still wasn't clear enough, I found another one online that's also a cute visualization of this principle. So, no sine wave without a circle, and maybe no circle without a sine wave. Um, anyway, so, but there's another thing I found online. If you just take another shape, you go around it, then, and you translate that to a waveform, then you get other kinds of waves, which is kind of interesting. Like, hmm, what can we do with that? Now, remember the Lissajou thing from earlier on. Ta-da. Uh, and I'll have had to put this slide in there twice, because I like this thing so much. Um, so this is literally about what, uh, how to visualize sound. What um, does sound look like in a certain way, is one way. So this is, this is a little a a a emulation of how, uh, because I, I remember vaguely that uh, in my early days on that little, tiny little computer that you took up to your television set, that I programmed this Lisa Ju curve, uh, and because the resolution of that thing was so poor, it must have looked sort of like this. So that's why I put that in there. Okay, but this is now uh, a Lisa Ju uh, a curve. Um, on an, a real oscilloscope, changing the frequencies and getting these things. So there's, these are the sounds, well, there's sine wave generators generating different frequencies. And at certain alignments at their frequency, so now it's, it's, one is going, one stays the same and the other goes up, but at certain proportions, they give these stable shapes. And I made it in such a way that they keep moving a little bit, right? See, in between there's lots of noise, but So actually these sounds were generated with a little program, but they're, they're, they're played as a sound. You hear the actual sound that I hooked up to the oscilloscope, and this, this sound literally visualizes this. OK, 
Okay, it's getting too loud and it's almost over. All right, so that is Alyssa Zucker. So, um, for instance, yeah, this is something I found online. I don't know who is behind this. It's really beautiful shapes, pretty much built on similar principles um, from shapes to sound. So, what can we do? Can we, instead of this circle or another shape, take a letter and turn that into sound? And if yes, what does it sound like? Well, this is what an Helvetica I sounds like. <laughs> this is what an L sounds like. Okay, it's all kind of the same, but there's differences. And so there's these different uh, harmonics. Let's bear with me. There's a All right, so that's some letters from Helvetica. Let's now do the same with Rockwell. It has these nice slaps here. Does it sound different? It's a little more aggressive, especially in this age. I think, I think you can hear some difference. And indeed, a rounder shape sounds rounder. It does, right? Okay, let's see, I have a couple more examples. Times, a little softer. Well, it also has a little edge. The Sarah's really, the more Sarah's, the more the high frequencies, maybe. Rounder. Less round. <laughs> did I do? Okay, here a, very, a rounded typeface and it's indeed much softer and sounds warmer as if it's a little muffled. So, and that's literally what's happening. And so the, the corners cause higher harmonics to be present in the audio. Um, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. All right, is there more? Okay. Um, now, okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and now do what they were doing. Yeah, different typefaces just with one letter. I kind of picked the S because it sounded kind of nice. So now we try to hear, it's more subtle. Do we hear more differences between the typefaces? So Rockwell's a little more aggressive. This one has fairly sharp corners. It's quite round, but in fact round it's very soft. Also quite soft. Not so soft. Quite unsoft. <laughs> So this the last one is from uh, Lucas de Groot, an experimental thing from the early 90s. So yeah, that sounds most aggressive. It sounds exactly like it looks, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right, so we had we went from shapes to sound, and let's now go from sound to shapes. So once we have those sounds, we can project them, as it were, on the oscilloscope. So same sounds, but now played live on the oscilloscope. So we can do yeah, okay, the my setup, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, I didn't have a great connection, so everything is a little bit noisy and a little bit rounded off. The frequency response wasn't all that great. But anyway, so we've gone full circle now, from the shape to the sound to the shape. So kind of lit so literally playing the sound on the oscilloscope, the left channel for the X coordinate and the right channel for the Y coordinate, or vice versa, I forgot. That, uh, so, now we have to do more math and, and fundamentals of waveforms. So I already uh, um, alluded to like the, 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 the most basic building block of a sound is uh, a sine wave. And all other sounds are, can be seen as um, composition of many, many sine waves. And if you're talking about a, um, a, a tone from, a, from an instrument that is, you can actually, you can, or from actually from any sound, you can calculate uh, there are, are algorithms, uh, given a certain sound, you can calculate where those frequencies of the other sine waves are, and those are the harmonics. And it's uh, invented by uh, well, the, 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 a guy called Fourier, um, did lots of research in that. So this, this is a sine wave, but if we add, um, for instance, three times the frequency, so you see in red, uh, uh, or, or no, double the frequency, sorry, double the frequency, and we add a, an, another three times, four times, just add more and more sine waves. Um, if you would do this indefinitely, we'll get a perfect sawtooth. Uh, or Yeah, sawtooth is the name. So, okay, we're not going to go there because it's taking too long, but you see it approaches the sawtooth more and more. So, uh, likewise, if you... If, let's see, I think I have another... Sorry, I have to go to the next slide. Likewise, if you take only the odd multiplications of the base frequency, uh, so this is three times, and then five times, and then 
seven, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you take the odd ones, and also the amplitude of what you see, the, the, the higher frequencies are added at a lower amplitude. But if you do this in the right way, we we'll get a perfect square, square wave, purely by adding sine waves. So vice versa. This kind of says from a square wave how, what frequencies are in that signal. So. For instance, this is uh, uh, an analog synthesizer with some filters and it's making a town tone. And it's my son there playing with the knobs and he's pulling the filter and different harmonics are be, you can hear them, but we plot the, uh, the waveform on the oscilloscope. So you kind of see this high harmonics, if it's getting lower, the waveform is getting a little longer. So this, just another example of how this works, the relationship between or how a waveform from sound actually looks like. Now, analyzing waveforms, the Fourier transform spectrum analysis, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, for instance, if the, that's top, this is from Wikipedia, the top line would be the waveform of a, of a certain note, I think from a bass guitar. Yeah, bass guitar, it says. And below is a plot of roughly where the frequent, what kind of frequency are present in that signal. And like uh, a tone controls or, or a graphic equalizer kind of like manipulates that bottom graph, right? So you, you can get, uh, uh, get rid of your, your high frequencies or, or boost your low frequencies, whatever. So that is kind of what this does in an algorithmic form. That is what the Fourier transform is about. So I, without sound, I translated a letter form to a waveform and then applied some uh, filters to that waveform and then constructed it back into a letter form. So here, in this particular example, I'm kind of cutting out the high frequencies, and to some extent, at some point, well, the whole thing disappears or turns into a fortune cookie, but, um, <laughs> or a rice grain even. So it's, uh, but this, this kind of really shows like there are frequencies available in that signal that makes the letter form. So by reducing the high frequency, you literally uh, soften your sharp corners because the sharp corners are created by the higher frequencies in the signal. So uh, next one um, does, I think, the opposite. Oh no, this, this is just like accentuating a specific frequency and like on a fairly small bandwidth. So, uh, and by the F is the frequency. So you see if it goes higher, then there's shorter waves. And if it goes lower, then there's, um, so this is boosting like a fairly small band of frequencies. Um, and if you go low, it will make your loudspeakers explode, just like it does with your letters. <laughs> so uh, a third example is instead of cutting the high frequency, to boost them in a certain way. And we get the opposite of sharp corners, which is ink traps or like spiky things. So this is kind of a, maybe this could have some use in type design. So. Maybe we're onto something, I don't know, but this is uh, kind of neat how, how this looks because it has these very soft uh, uh, transitions from straight lines to the spiky curves. So, okay, there are some glitches in the algorithm, as you see, but uh, at more moderate settings, it actually leads to something that one could... By the way, this letter G is from, from uh, Condor, from David Jonathan Ross, just in case you're curious. Um, all right, what else? Now let's do some actual audio signal processing. So uh, playing back those that the, the, the thing we've heard before uh, from some music software, playing it on the going even like you see my like uh, hacky kind of connection to the oscilloscope, and now we're actually applying some digital audio filters in the in, uh, in the Logic audio software. I forgot which filters these are exactly. So. These are yeah, just like a, like a chorus effect if you ever played with, with a, a sound effects. If you, so uh, below you see the, the, the clean sound and there's some effects. Uh, um, let's see, there's, there's a better example of that. And now if we, uh, instead of going to a, the oscilloscope, but actually just render that sound with the effects and then read back in that sound file and plot it out again as shapes, then I have these neatly drawn uh, animated uh, shapes that totally remind me of La Linea, but it's somehow this is how, uh, how they come out of that particular algorithm. Um, right, so this is actually um, at uh, uh, Ted Davis' studio in Basel, where I did this workshop, and he had several oscilloscopes and also some actual um, uh, sound effects. So I'm just now 
uh, you see me there turning some knobs of this effect machine and you can kind of see what anyway this is really nerding out Actually, the cool thing that, that unfortunately he didn't show the, 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 the left oscilloscope is like super old and it still works, but I didn't get to see it to work. But it's, it's like, it looks like this machine from a submarine or something. I don't know. It's just really great. Anyway, conclusion. I don't know. So, um, <laughs> so maybe the, the spiky thing could be used. I mean, it was a fun thing to, to work on and to look at. Um, I, the, the people that I showed it to, I was like, hey, did you think of this? And can you do, maybe do that? Sure, I mean, apparently it makes people think of um, also possibilities, which is kind of neat. So um, maybe that is already enough purpose for this. Um, I have not all that much more, so we're, get, we're closing in. Um, here, I'm going to show maybe some more boring, but more practical things. I was asked to design uh, um, an animated version of a logo for this, uh, this, uh, this online magazine that's founded by Jane Metcalf. Uh, Metcalf, uh, she's one of the, the, she's the co-founder of Wired magazine, and she's starting this online magazine about biological and technology and all kinds of things. And um, well, th this has been used for a little bit, but it's not really been implemented because of all kinds of technical things. I made an, uh, a version that is a little more uh, airy. Um, this project will hopefully continue at some point uh, um, where I hope to, to make different interpretations for different purposes. Um, so it's kind of uh, kind of neat to work on. You get this existing logo and now let's do something with it that make it make it move. So uh, I, could, I got really quite a bit of freedom uh, what to do with it. Um, anyway, but uh, next project. So I already mentioned Hansje van Halem earlier. She uh, if you were at Typographics, she did a great talk on the, on the Saturday of Typographics a few weeks ago. She is this amazing graphic designer from Amsterdam. Um, and I had met her earlier because for a while she did a guest course, she taught at, at KBK. Um, and later I met her again and uh, then I knew her work a little better and I, and I uh, uh, informally told her, like, hey, that your work lends itself so much for, or uh, let me actually show you, so this is two random shots from her website, you should check it out, her stuff is amazing. Um, but she works a lot with patterns and letters from patterns, with patterns. Uh, and I kind of knew that she's not a programmer, but she, she's working digitally a lot. She is like a, a pro in Illustrator. She knows all the tricks and has external plugins. She has, uh, well, all kinds of ways to produce the amazing things that she does. Um, but I mentioned to her, like, hey, some of the things you do really seem to lend itself for coding, for programming, because there seem to be some rules. And, yeah, and at some point, I think that, uh, that that idea kind of had clicked in her head because at some point she um, approached me and said, hey, I'm having this potentially uh, large commission and would you have a look at possibly collaborating with me? And that is what happened. So she got the commission to design a new identity for the Lowlands Festival, which is uh, the largest Dutch uh, 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 music festival. Uh, that uh, is every summer in August for three days. Um, it's really the, like, I, I don't know how many tickets they sell. It's, I think, over 50,000. It's, it's a pretty large thing. Um, so, um, but the, 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 the people that, that lead Lowlands, um, uh, they really liked her work. And um, they had already kind of decided, I mean, this is now kind of a remake of something that she made as a proposal. Um, and, well, the, 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 the client already liked that, but, you know, to make this, and this is just one letter, to do a whole word, she actually had to do lots of things in Illustrator. It's based on a grid, then things are laid inside the letters, outside the letters, and things had to be connected. And, I mean, she really took for a word, may, uh, to, uh, had, she maybe needed about an hour to build one word. Um, so, yeah, in the rules, I mean, I, um, I saw some of the things she was doing immediately, but she actually gave me a demonstration, like, hey, this is what I do. Like, aha. So that's, to me, made clear, okay, these are the steps that are needed to produce this. So um, I went to work with her and created this whole set uh, uh, of Python code that does that, but all parameter-driven, so all kinds of, so for instance, this is like a starting point, but... 
uh, how thick those lines are that could vary into the opposites. The direction of the grid could change. Um, uh, let's see what's going on further. Like um, the, 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 how round those corners are can be changed. Um, the, the resolution of the grid uh, can change, uh, so it can be made finer. Well, um, things can be made to animate. That was actually one of the things that she wanted to do, not only to use it in static typography for print or whatever, but to create animations. Well, obviously you cannot spend an hour on one frame for an animation for a text that might be changed tomorrow. So obviously there was a need for a programmatic approach to this. So that, that is what I did. Um, like this is a, a tiny shot of her uh, presenting at, uh, at typographics across the street. Um, so, um, uh, let's see, uh, this is a little commercial they made, um, it's like composited, well the, the background uh, comes from the algorithm but the foreground also and they were then manually in video software composed. But like the, the inside the yellow uh, uh, animation comes directly from uh, my software, we made this whole parameter driven uh, system where, uh, like Hansi herself, she's not much of a coder, but I learned her, taught her enough drawbot so she, I gave her like a template script and I, these are the parameters that you can change. Like here, make the letters larger, make it like that. So everything she had to learn like to work with those numbers. But in addition to that, I created uh, a, a set of so-called function generators that she could make an animation. Like let's vary the point size between 100 and 200 uh, uh, in over the course of time, or in a loop, or in a sine wave, or just in a ramp. So there were all these kinds of possibilities that she then went on and kind of used those numbers, uh, uh, producing these uh, these kind of animations. Uh, the website, this is a little tour uh, of um, uh, the website. Um, in the beginning, in a very early version of the website, we actually tried to use SVG animation. Um, but since this stuff, I mean, nothing really interpolates, it's there, it really has to be like individual frames. Um, we had something that worked, um, that it wasn't even so much data to transmit, but still to render that stuff on, especially smaller, older, older phones uh, turned out to be a problem. So they switched later to streaming video, which is cheaper apparently. So uh, all this stuff is now uh, streaming video. But the kind of, the, the cool, one of the cooler things that I contributed to this project is um, it's not only running in Drawbot, but I built enough of what is needed for this whole project to also run in a headless mode on a web server. So actually what you see here, the XX above, uh, that is directly uh, uh, controlled by the, the web editors. They go into their content management system, type the name of a new band, and then an animation is generated. It's not really in real time. It takes, might take a little while before it's done. But then there is this animation that uh, nor me nor Hansje had anything uh, to do with that, it's just working there. So that was it was kind of a, kind of a neat thing. How to also these banners? They're all generated uh, on the website. I mean, they were generated once. They were not super dynamic, but for every change that was made by the editors, a new banner could be generated if needed. So, um, so for more static use, also some fonts were made derived from the same algorithmic stuff. Uh, but, well, also, and then yeah, more, uh, um, this is still mostly the algorithm and maybe some fonts, I don't even know, but there's, of course, lots of print stuff, large posters that, uh, um, I mean, the, the system that I programmed, uh, uh, Hansi used to produce all these items. So some really nice uh, print stuff as well. It's looking nice this close up, I suppose. Um, this is nearly the end. So this is like the image that, uh, the screensaver that I started with. I, uh, um, you now Kara and Sasha were asking, yeah, we need to, to put your talk online, uh, give me, we need some promotional images, we need to put some stuff there so people will come and, uh, oh, and title, uh, what can I talk about? Anyway, at some point, you know what, I'm going to draw an A and a Z and I'm going to draw a really light one and a really bold one and I'm going to interpolate between them and then somehow do something with layers and animation and I didn't really know where this was going. Um, you see this is kind of, so um, I will actually go on to uh, this one, which is the original version, which is a different movement. You see the front letter actually stays the same, and actually the back letter too, but it's so dark that you can't really see it. I will try to pause the animation at the right moment uh, and 
pause it where it's in a neutral state. So here, oops, I wanted to stop it. So somewhere here. So here you kind of s literally see your, the interpolation go from this really bold one in the back and the really thin one in the front, which is also smaller. Uh, and it, by just layering many of them in between and coloring them in between from black to white going through some color curve that is this uh, bluish color. But somehow, you know, this uh, uh, by then, the, so, uh, because I drew so many of the layers, you don't see the layers anymore, if you, or you don't really experience them so much anymore. Wait, uh, I was still going to uh, go through this manually. It kind of feels like it's a rubber kind of thing. It has this like tactile thing. It has this really cool effect on the counter shape. So that was kind of the original thing. And then I thought the other thing, actually like this one, that it kind of has more this, this smoky, it kind of d dissolves into nothingness. Um, um, I somehow liked the movement in the end of that uh, a little better. But the fun thing is, yeah, you know, I almost considered like not showing the animation at all because if you, the static images are kind of neat. It's, it's an, a, an effect. And I'm actually already uh, working on a project with a client where I apply this effect to their logo, so in a, some, in a kind of different way. But um, it's, it's almost as if the animation gives away too much of what is happening. Right? If you just see this and it's, oh, whoa, it's a funky A, but, you know, now, now that I've told you with the interpolation, you can kind of see how, where this is going or how it was done. So this is from A to Z, and then uh, this is the rubber version, as I call it, and then I have a rubber version of the Z. So you see it has this state in the middle where it's also suddenly is becoming this normal thing. Let, let's also, uh, wait, let's pause it also at that crucial state, so that is like the shiny metal version or something, I don't know, but, uh, okay. but it almost becomes like the, to move in time is kind of like we're pulling a knob to, to control the thing, which is kind of neat as well. All right, that was it for today. Thank you so much for your attention.